happen. So there we go. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Gonzalez. I'm your instructor for this semester for STATS 412-612. So this is a mix between undergraduates and a few graduate students. This class, we're going to be learning programming in R, which is a thing I really like, which is why I'm teaching this class. Um, you probably want to know something about me. Uh, maybe not. I am a RStudio certified instructor, which means the company RStudio, which is a public benefit corporation, has people become trainers so that in corporations and classrooms, et cetera, people know what they're teaching and they're good at it. And we have to take tests and all this stuff. So I'm a certified trainer. It was a very fun process. Um, and I am not an American University professor. So Undergrads often don't know the difference between instructors and professors. I am an American University adjunct instructor, which means I'm not full-time employed by American University. I only teach this class basically, and it's something that I like to do, gives me extra money. And usually adjunct instructors are hired because they know something specific. So I know R, I know R very well. And so they hired me to teach you rather than being a full-time statistics instructor. Um, so that's kind of why I'm teaching, why I'm here. I'm actually in Arizona. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, so it's a little bit warmer here. I know you guys are probably scattered throughout the world um, and we're gonna cover that later. I debated whether or not I wanted to do introductions. And I think because as you'll see, we have group projects and things in this class, I think it's best that we do introductions, but that'll come in like 10 minutes. So. Um, oh, good. We have a few people filtering um, in the last few minutes. So the first thing I'm going to do now is go to our Canvas course. So let's figure out this dual screen sharing. I always laugh at professors when they do this, and then I do the same thing. So I need to share my screen, and I'm going to share that one. So let's see. Make this bigger. Okay, can you all see my canvas? Great. So this is Canvas. I think most people are familiar with it. I know American universities recently switched from Blackboard to Canvas, but this is Canvas. The only thing we're gonna be using Canvas for is to turn in our assignments and for me to grade them and give them back to you. All of the material, most of it, will be on our course website. So if you're if you log into Canvas, you can click the course syllabus or the course website, and that'll open into an external link. Well, it'll open a page that lets you open an external link. I don't know how to get it not to do that. And this is the website that lives live here at this link. Um, so you can access this without logging in. And this is our class in statistical programming in R. So here's the course landing page. Here is kind of like our course schedule for a, what a general week will look like. So we have class on Mondays and on Thursdays, generally, not this week. Um, on Mondays, we'll have a lecture. So it's an hour and a half of me live coding, teaching you what different things do, how they work. And then on Thursdays, we'll break into breakout rooms, probably between two and three people, if that works. Um, as we go, we might edit that and work on kind of projects together. So we will have a weekly lab assignment that you then need to turn in on Friday. This is a pass fail assignment. So put it in an effort and it'll do fine. I'll talk more in detail about that later. So we have two classes. We have the lecture and then the lab. In between the lecture and the lab is where you do your reading assignment. So rather than you reading something and kind of struggling through it, or at least this is my style, I'd rather have someone teach me it first and then read more in detail. That's how I've always been for math and statistics. So I think that'll work best for the class. So we have our lecture. I teach you. You have no idea what I'm talking about. And then you go read more in detail about it. Then we have a lab where we're putting into practice the things that we learned in both the lecture and the reading. We turn in our lab. And then about every other week, there's five homeworks total for this semester. And those will be due on Sunday night before the next Monday's class. So generally, homeworks will cover about two weeks of work. Um, so that's the general structure. If anybody has any questions, by the way, I didn't clarify this in the beginning, just turn on your mic and interrupt me um, or write it in the chat. I haven't seen any chats come up though. So, um, okay. So that's the general structure of the course. We can kind of see the structure too, if we click on schedule. So 
there's four main things that we just saw. We have a lecture, we have the reading, we have the lab, and then homework. Those are the four components of this course besides the final project. And you can see here's a breakdown of each class period slash homework assignment due and what it is. So for instance, today you have a lecture and you have a reading that's like you should do before the next class just because it's a Thursday start. Um, but then next week, you know, we'll have a lecture and then before the lab, you should do a reading and, a, and then you can download the lab material here, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see there's our first homework will be due on February 7th. That's the general structure. If you scroll all the way to the bottom here, you can see we have our final project due April 22nd. And I'll talk more about the final project after I talk about the first lecture. <laughs> I have to remember the workflow I created for myself so I don't talk for an hour straight. Um, so on our schedule, you can always access our lecture materials by clicking here. You can also click materials and there's a lectures button. So if I click materials right now, or lecture, you can see here's our first lecture. It's the only one uploaded so far. Um, and I'm just gonna walk you through this. So usually this will involve a lot more coding. So oftentimes this is like explanation, what codes I'm gonna be showing you um, or what codes I showed you. Um, and that will be uploaded here for now. This is more of a lecture on what is data science? Why are you taking this course? And how does R fit specifically into that? So instead of doing a PowerPoint, I just kept it as a um, like a prose document. So I'm just going to walk you through this again. Anytime you have any questions, anything I see that's unclear, please just interrupt me. That's very much my teaching style. So today we're going to talk about intro to R um, and data science. So if this is your first class you've ever taken that has anything to do with data science, or this is the first time you're really hearing the term data science, I'm sure some of you are data science majors. We'll learn about that soon. Um, Data science was coined in 2001, where basically this article said that data science is a discipline that incorporates varying degrees of data engineering, scientific method, math, statistics, advanced computing, visualization, hacker mindset, and domain expertise. That's kind of been refined over the years to look like this nice little Venn diagram. This is incomplete. People don't like this, but then some people do like it. It basically says that data science is this combination between statistics, this blue part, coding, this red part, and a domain expertise, this green part. So statistics would be <laughs> statistics, um, anything from causal inference, using modeling, machine learning, um, you know, anything from a getting the mean of a variable to running advanced deep learning to get a prediction out of it. So that's kind of the statistics part. But then we also have this coding part, which I'm jumping between. I'll talk about domain knowledge, I guess, and follow my own script. So domain knowledge is, I think, one of the interesting parts of data science, because you have data scientists working throughout industry, throughout academia, and they're generally tied to some sort of domain, whether that be biology, um, social science, business, business informatics. like. This domain expertise is really like, what are the questions you're asking? Why are you asking these questions? And what purposes do those questions serve? Um, it also can be, at least from my perspective, it can be, are we looking at prediction? Are we looking at what, like getting the most accurate prediction? Are we looking at what causes what and how does it cause it? And what are those relationships between those variables? Those are very two different mindsets, but they both fit into data science. Um, so. I didn't cover this earlier, but I actually have a social science background. And so most of my training was, I don't care how accurate my R squared is. If you don't know what an R squared is, that's okay. I don't care how accurate it is. I care about what are the relationships and what are the significance of these variables and how do they relate to each other and what's happening and why. That's generally my background, but I also have a lot of training with um, predictive analytics as well. So like I said, this lets you ask interesting questions. It asks questions that are relevant to what you're being trained to do. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to cover a little bit of this for the differences in what you all are studying as well. So that's also why at um, American University, there's like 12 data science undergraduate degree tracks. Um, and I know the administration is like, stop adding new tracks, but it's because domain expertise is such an important component of data science. And then finally, we have computation. That's 
learning how to code, how to run these massive data sets sometimes, how to get something you want out of a database into the format that you want and manipulate the data. Wrangle the data is a better way to say manipulate. Manipulate has a bad connotation and get it into the format that you want so that you can do statistical analysis on it. That's what this class is focused on. Importing the data, preparing the data, exploring the data, seeing what interesting relationships there are, and then also visualizing that data. That's one of the very fun things we'll learn in this class very early on is how to visualize this data. So as a data scientist, you can imagine how these three different skills, as long as as well as many other skills, come into play into different professions. There are jobs called data scientists, there are jobs called data analysts. There's a lot of things that you can do with data science, but I think the important part here is to emphasize that it's a balance between these three. So whereas we can look at this graph here and let me zoom in a little bit. So whereas a scientist, if you're a professor in academia, let's say, or whatnot, you usually have a lot of domain expertise. So you can see right here, a scientist would be like mostly domain expertise with some computation and statistics. A statistician on the other hand, as the name implies, would be mostly statistics and not as much domain expertise and not as much computational skills. A computer scientist, of course, would be mostly on the computational skills. So you can see there's like these three kind of different um, professions that would have a very imbalanced version of these skills, but still have a little bit of all of them. A machine learning engineer, for example, would be more computation, a little less domain and statistics, but data science itself prides itself in being a balance between all three. So now that we've heard all that, um, I'm sick of talking and wanna hear it from you all. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, let's do this in a pop popcorn way where Everyone will call on someone else. Um, I know we hate it, but it gets it so people don't have to volunteer. So we're going to do introductions partially because we have a group project due at the end of the semester. I keep alluding to that. I will talk about it, but also because I want to know who I'm teaching, what your like background is, what you're trying to learn. So I'll call on one person. If you can say your name, either your major or your academic program. Um, let's say your favorite food or like a food that you ate one time and it was really good and you want to explain where you were, something like that. And then why you want to learn R. And then after that, we'll go into more about R. So I'm going to call first on Rafael. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Rafael. I'm actually a graduate student. Um, I graduated from Penn State last year as an industrial engineer. Um, I'm doing my master's here in analytics. Um, I want to learn R because I think, you know, the world is moving towards everything is all the decisions businesses make are based on data. And I think R and Python are both programs that are very used nowadays. And it's great to hear that, Professor, you're an expert in R and I hope to learn as much as possible from you. Uh, my favorite food, I would say it's it's a good bacon cheeseburger. That's it's a pretty good standard for me, so that works. Important question, with barbecue sauce or with like ketchup? I would prefer ketchup though. <laughs> and very interesting, and now you can call on someone else. All right, I'll call on Mary. All right, hey guys, my name is Mary Catherine and I am a junior here at AU and I'm majoring in CLEG. And so since you're New to American University, I'll explain what that is. Um, it's a program through the School of Public Affairs in Communications, Legal Institutions, Economics, and Government. So it's a pretty popular major here at the university. Um, and I would say that my favorite food is sushi. And I'll call on Sydney. Hey everyone, um, I'm Sydney. I'm a first year PhD student in the behavior cognition and neuroscience program here. Um, I want to learn R because I wanna have as many tools as possible to do you know, all the stats and computing that I need to do for my science, uh, for my research, but also I'm a little bit interested in data analytics as a career after my PhD in case I don't wanna go the strict science route. Um, 
So I'm just kind of exploring that. And my favorite food is birthday cake. Um, yeah, okay, so that's me. Uh, I will call on Mal. Uh, so hi, um, I'm an undergraduate student, a junior now. Uh, I'm doing, I'm a psych major, but I've also have like, I was also a math major as well, but that scheduling didn't fall through. So I'm basically doing a bunch of quantitative classes like this one just to keep diversified. Um, uh, I'm really interested in learning R, mostly because similar to what Raphael said, you know, the seems the industry is very much going that way. And I think it would be a wise move for me to diversify myself and add some more coding stuff. Um, and I think I'd also go with sushi as my favorite food. Um, and go on, Cassidy. Hi, I'm Cassidy. I'm a sophomore and I'm studying political science, but I'm minoring in data science. And um, I wanna learn R because I just wanna have as many different kinds of program knowledge that I can. And my favorite food is watermelon. And um, I'll call on Ethan. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ethan. Uh, I'm a senior majoring in finance. And um, I want to learn R because I was told by um, one of my professors that it's a great skill to have uh, in business. Um, and I think it's uh, coding is the future in general. So I don't know how to do it. I don't know any of the programs. So uh, I figured it'd be good to learn one. And um, my favorite food is probably pizza. And uh, I would pick, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, Sam Semyon. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, hi, I'm Semyon. I'm a software computer science major. Um, I've been thinking this whole time what to say for my favorite food, but I don't think I really have a favorite food. Like, <laughs> I don't like picking favorites in general. Um, but I guess in general, I like salty snacks and I like fruit. Why and I'm going to. Oh, right. Why I want to learn R. That's. <laughs> um, well, I really like programming, and I figured that R would be like a really not only just a good skill to have but I'm also just I have an interest in statistics so I thought it'd be a really good blend of like trying to like find a very applicable form of statistics while also having it be related to programming and I'm gonna call on Ash um hi my name is Ash um and junior computer science major uh, minor in statistic and uh, the reason I like R want to study R um, because I took statistic for one five regression last semester uh, so um, it's in uh, we touch a little bit on R but not deep enough uh, so I want to study more about R um, my favorite food will be ice cream sandwich um, from Trader Joe. Um, okay, I will call next one. Um, Jean Rutan. Oh, hi everybody. Um, my name is Jean Rutan. Uh, my favorite food is whatever my mom cooks, I eat. Um, why I want to learn R is I have my domain knowledge is in communication theory at the media. And my interest is to predict human being behavior. And I'm currently really into stats and really into deep machine learning. But my coding skills cannot catch up with what I learn. So I really want to deepen my, my coding through your class. And I really want to learn from instructor and other, my peers. Thank you very much. 
All right, I'm looking through the list to see if we miss anybody. I think we missed one or two. So Hanway. Uh, my name is Hanway Hu. So um, I'm a sophomore and my major is statistics. So uh, learning art is part of uh, the requirements and and I also like programming and it's my interest. So I want to do something earlier. Uh, my favorite food is noodle or uh, all kinds of noodles. Um, yeah. So I um, I think I will go to Prague, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Pragya. I'm currently a sophomore studying SIS um, with a minor in data science. And uh, I want to learn R to learn a new coding language. And uh, my favorite food is ramen. OK, I think we have everyone. But if anybody wasn't called on, can you please speak up? I'm looking through the participants. I think we got everyone. No, we miss Henry. Are you here, Henry? Uh, yeah. Um, my name is Henry. I'm a junior, uh, and I have a. I'm majoring in math, and I'm taking this because uh, last year my roommate took R, and while well, I was taking Python, so we're basically like switching. He's taking Python now, and I'm taking R. And I'd say my favorite food is also ramen. These food questions are not great around lunchtime. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> At least it's lunchtime, I think, in most of our time zones. Um, OK, I think I'm triple checking. I think that's everyone, but please interrupt me, like I said. Um, I will now, oh, I should have stopped sharing my screen. Oh, well, um, go back to our lecture material. First of all, it was really great to listen to everyone's, first of all, your like major slash degree because I don't get that information, which I think is funny, or at least I don't know how to find it on Eagle service. Um, and now I wanna go eat all the food. So um, why are, well, first of all, you have to think about what the steps of any sort of analysis pipeline is. This here, you're gonna see a lot of times in your textbook, um, which is the basically analysis pipeline for any sort of analysis. So you start by getting some sort of data, making your data clean. This tidy and transform part are a big part of our class. Um, we aren't gonna to touch really on modeling, but we will touch on visualization. So getting your data through tidying it, transforming it is a huge part of any data scientist's job. Um, I've seen a lot of data scientists who basically they've taken polls and they say, what, what percentage of your job, job is tidying and transforming data? And it's like 80% of people's jobs. The fun part, yeah, is machine learning and doing all these predictive cool, cool things, but that's like ends up being a kind of final part of their projects. Most of it is getting the data, finding where the data is. If you're in business, you're working with, you know, a database of I would say over hundreds of tables and where is the data that you're actually looking for? How are you gonna create metrics from those data? Well, you need to tidy your data. You need to transform your data to create those things you want to visualize, the things you wanna model. You have to get that out. So that's a huge part of what data analysis will look like. Um, and this is very much in our workflow, but it's a very similar workflow for something like Python or Julia. And so there's a lot of tools you can use to go through this pipeline. Um, like I mentioned, Python, R, Julia, MATLAB, Stata, SAS, um, and then also other tools like SQL. You can use R to get stuff out of the database using um, a special package called dbplyr, um, which we'll talk about later. But you can also use SQL, and a lot of industry jobs want SQL. And so there's this balance between using SQL then using Git to use version control so that other people can see, oh, what did you do? When did you do it? When did you change your mind? Git is very important. Um, I assume the more computer science leaning people here know a lot about Git and then other people may have never heard of it. We're not gonna touch on it too much, but it's another really important part of the data analysis, data science pipeline. And then if you're using really big data, there's MapReduce sort of software for that. Um, and all of these have advantages and disadvantages, but 
R has a lot of benefits. I'm sure throughout this course, I'm gonna overhype R a lot, but that's because first of all, it's quite user-friendly, but at the same time, it's a really strong scripting language that isn't necessarily object-oriented programming. So as a person who doesn't have a strong computer science background, doesn't know how to code in JavaScript or something, you're able to pick this up very quickly. And I'm, I already know I'm gonna be super impressed how quickly you all are gonna get through our labs and our homeworks. And I'm gonna be scrambling to teach more material because you're gonna pick it up very fast. Um, so in R, you write code. Some of you may have never, never coded a line in your life and that's okay. We write code and then we run the code for it to do tasks. And R has more of a statistics background rather than like I mentioned, object -orient pro oriented programming, which would mean like a lot of different things. I don't wanna get into the weeds there, but R has more of a statistics background. And so it's more built for data science specifically. Um, with R, you have a base language and then you have apps that you can pull in. And what really makes R great is all of these apps you can pull in. And that's because R, as we'll talk about in a second, has a really strong community, a really strong um, maintainer community making these apps, making all of these things. If you don't know what an app is, or a program, sorry, I just keep calling them apps. A program is, it's kind of like an app, like on your phone, you have a base phone, but then you want to do extra things. You want to use, I don't know, Facebook Messenger. That doesn't come based on your phone, so you have to install it. And that's the same thing with R and most programming languages. So why R? If you use something like MATLAB, a lot of the statistics people here probably have used MATLAB in the past. I think finance is really strong in MATLAB too. Um, it costs money. You might have it free through the university right now, but eventually you have to pay for it and it's not cheap. And every time there's a new version, you have to pay for it again, just like Stata, just like SAS. That's great for some people. But if you are committed to something like open science, you want other two people to be able to replicate what you're doing. R is really great because it is open source. People can modify it, people can make it better. And it's like a living program. And it's also free. Like who doesn't want something free? <laughs> um, then also, R more than Python, having been involved in both of the communities, R's community portion of it is what really made me stronger in R in the end because there's so many different groups. There's R user groups, there's groups called R ladies, which is open for all genders, but R ladies is really great. Um, the R for data science community, there's like these Slack groups and Twitter, all of these different things people come together and really support each other in learning because they're all doing the same thing. They're all wanting to get better at data science and machine learning in general. So as you can see here on this cute little infographic, you'll see a lot of these. It's from a person who works at our studio. They're beautiful. Um, the support community is really great here. Um, you can see that we have maintainers, we have teachers, bloggers, friends, mentors, developers, contributors. Instead of doing something on your own and trying to learn it all, buying the textbook we're going to use and just trying to learn it all on your own, it's much better with a community. And that's where R really excels. So not only will you get that a lot of times from me, but you will see it probably when you're struggling with a homework problem and you Google, <laughs> you'll see so much about R and um, people trying to help. So, and it's, as I mentioned, it's also relatively easy to learn. Um, it was driven by st statisticians originally. And so it's the steps you go through are much more user-friendly than something in Python. Python can be, have a really hard learning curve because you need to know Python before you can really do anything with it. Or you can kind of just get started and we're gonna do that next week. We're just gonna get started. Um, I really like this graphic. It shows how much time you spent learning R and how you feel, <laughs> um, how much you think you know. You're, most of you are probably starting here like I know nothing about R. We're gonna get to a point where you're like, I know everything, I'm so cool. And then you're gonna fall again and then you're gonna go up and then you're gonna go, you know, it's it's a learning curve. Um, there's a name for this and I've completely forgotten it, but it's how a lot of people, when they know very little about a subject, act like they're experts. Um, yeah, no, I cannot remember the name of it, but it's, it's the same kind of thing. And then finally, R is really good for reproducible analysis. So you heard me mention open science. Reproducible analysis is really important because if I want to send a report to my supervisor 
and the report is based off Excel and I changed some cells and I accidentally, you know, I'm getting coffee and I actually click the enter button or click a number. I can change everything in the Excel sheet without knowing that I changed it. So what's really important is being able to see the process of what you did when and follow it. And you can do so many really cool things with R besides the visualizations, which you can run an entire script with one button and it'll recreate the same thing. You can create reports, you can create websites. This whole website was created with R. Um, people coming from computer science might be like, no, it wasn't. There's also plenty of HTML and CSS, but it is based in R and that's where I created it was through R Studio, which is really cool. So it can create comparable pipelines. People can look at your R and see what you did. You can um, automate your analysis. If you wanna do something more than one time, you can automate it and you can iterate. All of these really cool things R is really great at, um, partially because of R Markdown, which we're gonna talk about next week. So a few people mentioned Python. Python can do a lot of the same things R can. I find it less user-friendly. I find the community a lot less friendly. Um, maybe it's because I'm a woman. Maybe it's because my background is in social science. Who knows? Um, but Python can be very good. But as I said, it can be a lot harder to learn for first-time programmers. And there's just a lot of things that are not like intuitive. So that's one of the reasons we're learning R. Um, in R, there's two main flavors. There's base R, which means you don't load any of those apps or packages, like I mentioned. You're just programming in R. You can do that, but a lot of things are gonna take you a lot longer. They might be a lot less intuitive. Um, and so there's the non-base R system, which we're gonna use called Tidyverse. Tidyverse is this universe of very evangelical R users. I am a part of this, who, we really like doing data analysis in a certain way. That doesn't mean there's one way to do it, but using a, a, pack, a set of packages to do something creates a very a flow you can follow when you're reading through scripts. Um, it's convenient and fast. And you can see here in this little diagram, we've got the tidyverse, which is what we're even using, the tidy universe. Um, and then things like per, read R, lubridate, tidy R, forecasts. We're going to talk about all of these. Right here is a pipe. If you don't know what a pipe is, we'll talk about that next week. Um, maybe it's the week after, soon. So I'm going to head now to the syllabus so we can go over that a little bit. If you have any questions about data science, if you have any questions about R, reach out, speak up. You all are very quiet, so that's okay. Um, so now I'm gonna click the syllabus tab. So here on the syllabus tab, you can just click quickly through if there's something you specifically wanna look at. Um, I've talked about a lot of these already. By the end of this class, you'll know how to install R and use it, import data, use all of these tidyverse capabilities to really transform and support your analysis. Um, there's stuff you can do after this class that you could build up to in modeling later that are in the textbook we're gonna be using. Learn how to write functions, how to use those functions to conduct statistical analysis. Um, R Markdown is something we're gonna talk a lot about. That's basically combining R code with text. And so if I wanna write a report, I can write out paragraphs of text put our code in, say, don't show this code, just show the, the graph or the table I want to produce. And it all gets um, compiled into one. So you're not copying and pasting. Um, and that also builds on LaTeX um, in the background as well. So you can use LaTeX mathematical symbols in your R Markdown document. It's really cool. Um, I learned all of these things through a lot of different sources. And I'm basically bringing it all together for you guys. Um, you know the course prerequisites. The textbook is a broken image because I didn't fix that, but here's the textbook we're going to be using. It's called R for Data Science. It's written by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grohlmund. Hadley Wickham is the creator of the tidyverse. Basically 12 years ago about, he said, oh, the way people are doing data analysis, it's not replicable, all of these things. Let's make this tidy. Let's create these workflows. Let's use ggplot, which he created ggplot based on the grammar of graphics. We'll get into that. Um, that's the textbook we're gonna be using and it's all linked throughout the schedule for all the chapters we'll be reading. It's free, it's available online. There's a hard copy if you want it. Um, generally the online version's more up to date, more, more up to date than the hard copy. So as they've gone through changes in the way the code works, it's up to date here. So 
plus it's free. So just use it online if you want. Um, you need to be able to run R on your computer. So have a computer that can use R. Um, we're going to use R and R Studio. So those are two different things. R is a language. R Studio is a software or a um, IDE, which I just forgot what that stands for. Interactive development environment, I think. Um, Isn't it integrated development environments? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I knew Semyon would know. He's he's pretty close to my screen, so I was just staring at him going, he knows what IDE is. Um, so it's an IDE for the R language, but it really makes everything nice. So we're gonna install R, we're gonna install R Studio, and that's kind of one of your homeworks for this um, weekend. Um, I'll show you where I give instructions on how to do that in a second. Um, there's plenty of places for online help. A lot of this, just read it. Um, be nice, be honest, don't cheat. I'm not gonna be a stickler on this. Well, obviously I'm gonna be a stickler about cheating, but like, you all are adults. I rely on you to be adults. Be good people, be nice. Use the packages we teach in this class. There's just a lot of language on here that I had to include, as I'm sure you can imagine. Follow American University's academic integrity code. When you do all that, I will respond to your emails very quickly. I will grade assignments within four days. Um, one thing you might want to know, uh, We've learned as professors basically that some students don't know what office hours are. I, it surprised me, but some students think that office hours are times that you're not allowed to talk to us. That's the opposite. So I have something called student hours where um, if I open this up in a new tab, if you click here to schedule an appointment, basically I have hours set each week where you can make an appointment. We can meet one-on-one -on -one and talk about whatever it is you need help on homework, you don't understand code, you just wanna learn about me, I wanna learn about you, what's your background? Anything like that, you just want general mentoring, you can schedule hours, those are times I have for you all. We're on Zoom, you're already here, you understand it. We're gonna be recording so people can look back on it, people who miss class, et cetera. It's 2021, it's a continuation of 2020 and I think you're all used to it by now. Um, I do have the chat pane open generally. So if while I'm teaching, you don't wanna interrupt, but you wanna ask a question, feel free to write something. As well as if we're in a lab or if we're live coding and you're having an issue, you can share your screen. Everyone has presenter privileges. We'll also use breakout rooms, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the important part, which I'm sure everyone's worried about is what are you being graded for? So 10% of your grade is the labs you're gonna be completing. There's a lab every week. So there's, there's about 11 labs total um, those are pass fails. So you just turn them in. You're going to get credit if you put in an effort and tried and did something pretty decent. If you didn't, you're not going to get credit. It's a pretty small part of your grade. So it's not super crazy. The assignments though, the homeworks are a larger part of your grade. Whereas labs are working together assignments. I kind of expect that you try to do these on your own because that's how you learn best. Um, it's for your own learning. There's five assignments throughout the semester. That's 40%, whatever 40% divided by five is, is how much each of them are worth. They're a little bit longer. It's every two weeks. So this is more of a cumulative assess or a cumulative thing that we're doing while we go through the class. And then finally, we have our final project. I've been alluding to this a ton, so I might as well talk about it. <laughs> Let me open it up in the assignments tab. Check on time. Okay, good. Um, if I go to here, here's the final project and you can click through all of these different parts, but the overview is what you care about now. We're going to talk about this more in depth later, but basically you're going to have a final project. You're going to be doing a report using some tidyverse analyses with some statistical analyses thrown in there. Um, let's see if I have the exact thing. No, it's under final report. So, you know, in your report, you're going to have an introduction, hypotheses, data preparation, what you did for exploratory analysis, what your findings were. And then with that report, you're also going to do a presentation. With that presentation, you'll be graded on both the PowerPoint and the presentation. Um, we're all going to grade the presentations together because your community is who's grading you. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but you'd need to know now that you're going to be in groups of two to four for this assignment. It's going to be more towards the end of the semester, but mid-February, I think, let's see, late February is when you need to have your general topic. You don't need your exact data chosen, but you need to have a general topic as well as who's in your group chosen. Um, I mean, there's not much else to say on that. It's a final project. It's not too terrible. Uh, 
Okay, back to this. So that's worth 50% of your grade. The reason it's worth 50% is because it's a big project, but also because working in groups is an important part of any job you'll have in the future. And obviously no one's gonna like fail this. So it, it ends up working fine point wise. So some of you may be looking right now and being completely overwhelmed. Some of you may not. If you're overwhelmed, I promise you can succeed. Coding can be very difficult, but it's also very rewarding. I love it because I love solving puzzles. And every time I'm doing kind of one of these tidyverse data wrangling things, I just, I love solving puzzles. And so I get super into it. I just did one of these big challenges yesterday. It's just something I enjoy doing, but I'm constantly looking up documentation. I don't have things memorized completely. There are things I remember how to do, obviously, but there's some advanced tasks that you don't use a lot that you might have to look up and that's okay. Um, Hadley Wickham, who wrote the textbook we're gonna be using and who created the Tidyverse, as I mentioned, he's also the chief data scientist at our studio. Really cool dude. He said, it's easy when you start out programming to get really frustrated and think, oh, it's me. I'm just really stupid. I'm really bad at this. I'm not made out to program, but it's not the case. Everyone gets frustrated. Even he still gets frustrated and occasionally when writing all code, it's just a natural part of programming. Um, it happens to everyone. It gets less and less frustrating over time and don't blame yourself. Just take a break, do something fun, then come back and try again later. So Allison Horst, who's the person who makes all these great visualizations, did this little visualization that says, oh, I have an error. Err, I'm having more errors. Ah, more errors, more errors. Maybe it's a bug. And then someone else says, oh, you wrote length incorrectly. Like we all have these small errors. That's part of what the lab is for is us coding and being like, oh, you, you spelled length wrong. It's part of the process. So hopefully anytime you're super frustrated and you're like, this sucks, I hate this, come to office hours. We can chat it out. I can help you. That's my job. This, we're in a pandemic. We're still in a pandemic. It's still not gone away. We're all just waiting, but none of us is okay. Life sucks. We're gonna be okay eventually. But if you need something, talk to me. If you lost your job or this or that, or someone died, talk to me. Like maybe it's cause I'm not a 80 year old professor, but I'm not super strict on these things. Obviously don't take an extension cause you wanted to go to a wedding or who knows, like something silly. But if you have something you need, take an extension. Like it's your, your mental health is important. I want you all to be safe. I want you all to be healthy. So I think you're going to be fine. There's counseling, there's special needs, any of this, you know, just talk to me or, you know, talk to counseling, whoever it is. Um, okay. I think that's everything on the syllabus. Let me just make sure I went through the schedule. Um, okay. So now let's say you finished your first lab. You want to upload it. You would go to Canvas. You can either click modules or assignments. This is not student view, so it looks a little bit different than yours, but, and then you can click the assignment box and upload it. Simple as that. Might not be that simple, but um, if you're having any issues with that, let me know. One thing I do have uploaded here that's not on the website is how to install R. It, there's a different version of it on resources. So again, one of your assignments before Monday is to install R, R Studio. basically just follow this guide. If this one doesn't work for you, if you're having any issues, you can use the one on Canvas, which is loading. It's a PDF, it's a little bit different, but it's basically the same thing. Install R, wait, where do we go? Install R, install R Studio. Um, you know, follow the directions, see if you can get Tidyverse installed and Tiny Text installed. Tiny Text is a basically a very light version of LaTeX. So if you already have LaTeX on your computer and you know what that is, I don't think you necessarily need this, but go through these instructions, get it all installed. It should be pretty straightforward on both R and Mac, sorry, Windows and Mac, um, as well as um, Linux. Any issues you're having, just email me. I'm available here. And that's, I mean, that's about it. I kind of want to open up the floor to you all now and see what you're feeling. I have a feeling this means that no one's going to talk, but. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Oh, uh, like what kind of file format are we going to be submitting our assignments in? That's great. So on the first lab, 
Generally, you're going to submit both an .rmd, which is an R markdown document, and either a PDF or um, HTML document. When you knit R markdown, which means you take the code and you compile it into a format, the default is HTML, and that's the easiest one to get working. But if you PDF is better and it looks better and it's easier to grade, but it might be harder for some people to do if they don't get tiny tech installed correctly. PDF would be better, but sometimes, you know, we're going to work through those bugs as we encounter them. But yeah, generally it's going to be a dot R markdown so I can see your code and then your compiled outputs. Yeah. I just have one question. I don't know if yeah. I misunderstood, but lab one is for Monday. No. So lab one is next week. All right, all right. Um, let me pull up the schedule just so I can show this. So I always well, have an issue so with for this. Monday is, is like installing R and like R Studio and all that, right? Yes. Okay. So you can see I gave you a reading here and that's for before next period. I could have put it here. Um, this is basically if we click here. Um, two chapters of the book, which are really intro introductory. And then also a video of our studio conference, which is actually going on today, but this is last year's our studio conference. And I think it's a really great video to look at to see what you can do with R. It's, it's basically this person who works at Lego getting better at R through learning side projects. And I think it's a really good video for you all to see like, oh, these are things I can do. This is how I can learn really good steps as I progress in my learning path. You're gonna read the introduction, which is a, kind of a lot that I've covered, but just from Hadley Wickham's perspective. <laughs> and then also basics of, you know, very basic coding and workflow. And we're gonna cover a little bit of that in the lecture on Tuesday, Monday. So this one, this, this row right here is kind of more confusing than the rest of them, but you're going to do install R, install R Studio, that which was under resources, and then read those chapters. And the reason I said I'm, ba I'm bad at naming things because it's hard to say, should I name it by the week number or should I name it by the lab? Because it's the first lab, which is here, but it's in week two. Anyways, teaching is always a pain. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing. Any other questions? It doesn't seem like it. So get those things installed. If you already have them installed, make sure they're up to date. Um, there was not too long ago, a really big new release of both our studio and some of the packages we'll be using. So um, if you already have some of these installed, probably reinstall them or update them. And that's it for Monday. So Monday, we'll start talking about basically working directories and projects and our markdown files, kind of all of that. And then the week after that, we're going to start talking about visualization. So we're going to jump right into visualization. It's the most fun thing you can learn in the beginning, and it really makes you feel empowered. So that's one of the reasons I teach it so early. So by the end of two weeks from now, you're going to be coding plots, which is super fun. So unless you all have any other questions, I'll let you go a little bit early and see you all Monday afternoon. Thank you, Kelsey. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.